Hello and welcome to the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast, where we listen to people's fairy encounters. But take heed, we're not talking about winged tinkerbells here. These are real fairies, real encounters that took people like you and I by surprise. Stay a while and hear their stories. My name is Joe Hickey Hall and I'm a folklore researcher. Dear listener, welcome to Series 7. I hope you are all well and had a great summer or winter, depending on which hemisphere you're in. I just returned from seeing family and exploring my ancestral roots in Ireland. I'll be releasing a video on Patreon about my visit to Lebecali Tomb in Cork. It was great to hear how much you enjoyed the two guest host takeover episodes during the summer and big thanks again to Claire, Kate, Bethan and Icy. I'm so grateful to the many of you who have joined me on Patreon over the summer. I took a big step recently and decided to walk fully into doing this full time along with distant healing appointments. This has been a huge leap of faith for me but I'm walking my talk and trusting my trip. Even though it does feel like stepping into the abyss, it feels right. The support and companionship of my Patreon community means a great deal to me, and I am looking forward to meeting many of you at the next Curious Crew online event in a couple of weeks. This time it will be a sigil workshop presented by one of our members, I'm really enjoying these get-togethers where we get to share our specialities to the rest of the group. We're kicking off the new series with a fantastic guest. Author Patrick Harper will be well known to many of us for his book, Demonic Reality, A Field Guide to the Other World. And I highly recommend reading The Philosopher's Secret Fire, A History of the Imagination, which I feel sheds a lot of light on the sorts of experiences we hear about here, along with his other non-fiction book, A Complete Guide to the Soul. Here we talk about his family's relationship with the other world, and whether an openness to their existence aids the potential for personal encounters. We ponder the eccentricity of our modern Western culture in denying the existence of these daemons and Patrick offers ideas about which gods may be ruling us at this time. I hope you enjoy this discussion. Let me know on Instagram and Twitter. I have some wonderful personal experience shares coming up in the following episodes of this series. In the bonus episode, Patrick reveals his fascinating childhood treasure-finding experience. There's something about it which reminds me we are all born curious with a foot in this world and arguably one still in the other world from whence we came. To stay connected in this material plane, we should endeavour to remain curious. everybody and welcome to the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast and I am delighted to have with me author Patrick Harper. Many of the people that watch and listen to this podcast will have read his fantastic book Demonic Reality, A Field Guide to the Other World. He's also written a number of other excellent books, The Philosopher's Secret Fire, History of the Imagination, and The Secret Tradition of the Soul, among a number of novels. Patrick's work suggests new ways to approach and understand otherworldly experiences, including dreams and visions from a Platonic philosophy, Jungian perspectives, Renaissance magic, and tribal perspectives, as well as various models of the universe. Thank you very much for joining us, Patrick. Welcome. You're welcome, Joe. Yeah, as as you've just said, you know, it's not a new way of looking at things at all. It's a very old way that I've cobbled together out of different bits of different disciplines. You know, because there's a lack of cross disciplinary um, reference these days. You know, that you have to go right across the board to compose a daimonic worldview. See what I mean? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this is why many of us find your books immensely helpful, because you have this clarity of vision with it, and you're able to bring, whether they are the older philosophies, or the new perspectives of different world models, and be able to present that in a way that is really clear. Um, and it's extremely insightful. So, you know, we're very thankful for what you've been what you've been doing and what you continue to do. Oh, um, fine. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, I mean, like myself, your your family were, you know, quite open to these sorts of ideas of there being other worlds and these beings that may emerge from those other worlds. I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that and whether you think that that's important in terms of experiencing, because it seems to me talking to guests on uh, my podcast and as part of my research that there's often at home a, an, a kind of open way of approaching these ideas. Yes, yes. Um... Yeah, yes, I was very fortunate in in that respect, but I never, I was never conflicted, you know, um, that that supernatural experiences were not poo pooed in my family at all. My, in fact, my mum was very keen on them, uh, being uh, uh, by by temper. She, my my both my parents were Christians, but um, in a very um, undemanding way, you know, in those days you went to church twice a year or something like that, you know, and, um, and but, but they they did lead me to, they did sort of hint at the idea that religion was the most important thing, you know, it wasn't really openly discussed, but I just got the idea that, you know, that, that God was very important. But then at a lower level, my mother was uh, very interested in spiritualism, and that was because her own mother, my grandmother, had been a very, very good medium. Uh, she did automatic writing. And uh, and sometimes and during the war, particularly, she used to have quiet times where she'd go into a semi-trance. And uh, it was rather, rather frightful, really, because she would quite often get um, dead soldiers coming through who were a bit bewildered and lost. And my mother would have to be on hand to um to to talk to them. She'd have to talk them down, as it were, you know. And uh and so she got rather and she was a very young, quite a young girl at, the, at that stage, about 19 or 20. And um there was one very quite chilling instance actually, in which one of the one of the soldiers that came through my grandmother was a was a soldier that she knew, not very well, but an acquaintance, you know, and he was saying, good Lord, you know, Alicia, that's her name, you know, what are you doing here? You've changed your hair and things like that, you know, quite, really quite striking. Anyway, my mother was a, was a, was very interested in spiritualism and wherever she moved, she always made sure to get hold of a, the local medium, you know, She'd always go along, especially healing mediums. As children, we were quite often wheeled along to some medium to have our petty ailments healed and so on. So we were quite happy with that idea. You know, we thought it was a bit wacky, but, you know, we humoured our mum. You know, it was great. My father didn't say much, but in fact, he was the deeply psychic one. Uh, but he was, um, he'd been in the war and had been shot, uh, had been, his nerves had been shot to bits in the war and so on. And he'd he was knuckled down to a career in business he worked in fleet street and so he didn't really talk much about it but he never um you know he, he never contradicted my mother or said it was rubbish or anything like that and indeed he was happy to recount his own fairy sightings as, as a teenager you know mm -hmm. so he lived with he lived with that his his fairy sightings were all the more unusual i should add because um he came from a long line of church of ireland Protestant clergymen and uh, and their the Protestant culture was of course more English than Irish really Anglo-Irish are, are, are sort of trapped between the two worlds you know um, but he he'd had experiences and his sister ha had also had experiences of of fairies which suggests of course that it's not that they, it, what fairies weren't in in their culture but they saw them nevertheless as it were 
suggesting that fairy sightings are more to do with the place and the state of mind of the percipient than it is to do with cultural expectations and so on. Yeah, it might suggest that, mightn't it? And even uh, it seems to, it seems to me, speaking to people, that it does seem to run in families too. It does seem to be to move through generations. Now, whether that is, you know, teaching just way of being um, and being open or something else, we don't know. But I do find that interesting that you will mm. get, you know, mothers, grandmothers, and and the you know the grandchildren or reporting experiences without, you know, sometimes without knowing that uh, the grandmother did as well. So I see. Um, right, right. Yeah. 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 Um, I have three siblings and the, the four of us, only one of us, my brother has seen um, anything funny. Really. Mm -hmm. It's not quite true. I've seen a fairy light in Ireland. Right. Um, it was um it wasn't it wasn't a, a light that i'd come to expect from the literature it was like a flare going up in the air and i know for a fact that it wasn't an actual flare because of where it came from which is the middle of a bog um and um my only point of contact with that was was reading of wb yates seeing exactly the same thing he saw a a flare like light shoot up into the sky quite slowly not you know quite flare like in other words yeah and um and so i i was encouraged by that comparison to believe that i'd seen a, a, a fairy light um my brother has seen fairy lights and he saw them at my other brother's house where we were all gathered and he came back into the house and said quick come out there's fairy lights on the other side of the river Nobody could be bothered because we were all eating and drinking, except me. I was keen. So I went out. The extraordinary thing is is that I have... Um, he actually punched me the other day because he said, do you remember those fairy lights? And I said, no, the trouble is I don't. <sighs> I have no memory of it at all. Yeah. And that is a common thing also with, with daemonic events, isn't it? Mm. That um, sometimes you just don't remember, you know. It is interesting. And it's something else reminds you and it brings it to mind and you do remember it. But in my case, I was reminded but didn't remember it. So so I can't claim that any, any of my generation, in other words, have had very startling, daimonic events, you know, apart from my brother who's seen fairy lights, he's seen a couple of UFOs and so on, you know. But, oh, I mean, is... sorry. No, no, go on. I was going to say, in a sense, you know, <laughs> um, what you've done with your work is, I would, you know, perhaps describe as demonic in some senses, that you've you've been able to bring that through in a way that, you know, masses are able to to understand it. Um, you know, that may not have, have happened if you hadn't written that book. So there is that small, <laughs> small thing. Yes, well, that's true. That's true, but I, I sometimes I think I speculate somewhere sort of rather vaguely that it may be the case that if you've already imaginatively taken in the idea of diamonds, you sort of don't need to see them. Because it's quite often people who don't believe in fairies at all and don't believe in UFOs at all who see them. It's almost as if mm. they're being bludgeoned into into some sort of recognition of the daimonic through their through their encounters and but i don't know if that holds true i i don't know because i suppose you could equally argue that a lot of people who do believe in fairies do also see them it can be Sub true like subsequently that. yeah yeah it can be I mean, did you did you believe in fairies before you saw yours I wasn't really into fairies at all. Um, I wasn't, uh, you know, I, I think the last time I had had an interest in fairies and they weren't the kind of flower fairies, um, but just the stories from my dad. And it was always, you know, children being in a, a lane somewhere in rural Ireland because he was talking about his own youth and um, 
and that they they get lost because they go off exploring and then suddenly it's it's uh, twilight and they come across you know a fairy fort or um somewhere you know sacred somewhere sacred in the landscape and uh you know or, or a fairy ring and the idea of not going into the fairy ring so I had stories like that and I, I was never really into fairies and I would, I'd never expected to see one at all so right. yes that that was interesting and if, in fact the the woman that um I used to go and learn about auras and healing and things like that from she had said she'd seen a fairy and I just thought that was ridiculous so yeah I I it's definitely not on the cards for for me to see anything so I guess in that respect um I am one of those <laughs> examples of people that I wouldn't have expected to although I was kind of open-minded but I, mm. in um I think it's in um I can't remember whether it's in demonic reality or secret fire now you mentioned that you know there doesn't always have to be a message from that being just the simple fact of them appearing is the message itself and um, I, I, I agree with that, that just the fact that they turn up can be enough, you know, because some people, if if, if they hear about an experience that, that a person's had, they want to know about that encounter. Oh, what did this mean? What did this mean? But yeah. the fact of, of just, it's like a switch from, from not knowing and being completely unaware to sudden knowingness. And that changes you and that's enough. Is that what you meant by that, do you think? Um, I I may have been rationalising the fact that there are quite a lot of encounters with no messages after the fact, if yeah. you see what I mean. <clears throat> but I, I do think I do think there's a sense in which they are they are their own message, mm. that their very appearance just automatically subverts the the worldview that has been designed to exclude them. And um people would do well to, most people have an experience of that kind and um we we have no idea how many people have experiences like that and never mention them mm. um i should think it's yeah. considerable because they have nowhere to put them there, there is nothing in our modern world view which, which allows for fairies um that, that they're just risible you know so it may be that people just either forget it immediately as i did or else or else just you know put it in a separate box altogether you know because they, they don't know what to do with it and in a sense that that's partly why i wrote the book because um i i thought well you know i'm quite happy with them i think they appear but i don't know where they fit in with anything really you know but of course once you pursue fairy law to its to its end you begin to isolate certain characteristics of, of the fairies, their elusiveness, the fact they're always marginal, the fact that they're shape shifters, shape shifters <clears throat> um, the, the fact that they are contradictory and paradoxical at all times, including the worst one of all, that they are, they seem to be both material and solid and evanescent and ethereal at the same time or in quick succession. All these characteristics, you know, um, began to sort of make sense to me as a sort of way of looking at the world, you know, that they became a sort of metaphor for the way in which elusive, marginal, shape-shifting, paradoxical realities, such as we encounter in dreams and the imagination, may well be the foundation of, of reality, rather than this wacky byproduct because um you know in other words you have to change your whole way of viewing the world in order to grasp fairies as a reality of some kind you know yeah um i think that's what i what i thought yes yeah i mean you know in that way the the greeks seem to know a lot more than we do um about these worlds and and kind of accepted them as as this is this is the world and this is what it's like could you talk a little bit about that for people that are unfamiliar well i, I with wouldn't just ideas? say i wouldn't just say greeks i mean what, what one of the things that encouraged me in my uh, in my explorations of the fairies was that it soon soon became apparent to me that there is no culture which which doesn't believe in diamonds 
including our own before, are uniquely eccentric, modern, post-enlightenment age, you know. And what's more, as far as I can tell, pretty much all of them have have the same characteristics of the sort of attributes I've just listed that, that the fairies have. Um, it's true to say that they don't always take their own form, as it were, because in some cultures, the part of the fairies or the diamonds is played by animals. And well, that's particularly true of animistic cultures. And in uh, some cultures, it's played by the ancestors. So, you know, you can have those those three categories of, of diamonds, animals, ancestors, and entities which are unique in themselves, like the Irish fairies are, for instance, or like the the jinns are in Arabia, or the Quaishins are in China, or the Yunwetsunzi amongst the Cherokees or whatever. You know, those are all they all have their own being. They they are all usually small and eccentric looking you know in other words it's not just the ancient greeks who are happy with mm. with die bones and the romans who were even more fervid you know they were almost hysterical in their in their belief in in die bones that there's barely a rock or a tree or a stream or a or any natural object which doesn't have its attendant die bone, you know so um you know, it just occurred to me that it's we who are eccentric in 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 not believing in them or or not taking them into account, mm -hmm. and that maybe we should be interacting them, interacting them with them more. You know, to prevent things like misfortune. You know that that all all these cultures took these entities, these creatures, into account and um, were very respectful of them because they could wreak havoc. And, you know, as, as the Irish leave out milk butter or used to, as a sort of offering, you know, you feed you feed the diamonds, um, you make little sacrifices to them, you could leave things on your plate for them, things like that, you know, just little tokens, because they need to be acknowledged, they need to be not literally fed, but metaphorically heeded, so that they don't uh, turn against us. I I don't I don't know how many I don't I you know I wonder how much misfortune is is caused by our neglect of the of the diamonds. Perhaps that's a whimsical thought, but you know. Uh, yeah, I just wonder whether you think that these ways are coming back. To be honest, because we do have lots of people that are very much interested in these subjects. Um, there's just so many researchers like myself that are looking in to these experiences um, and of course you know we have the whole kind of ufo research going on in the background as well well in the foreground for for everybody else but for me I, you know i'm focused on fairies but i'm aware that you know that's become really huge and mainstream um, but in terms of fairies and the way that we even um now relate to nature there's definitely a resurgence and a different way of approaching these beings I mean if you if you think about fairy doors as well and people leaving offerings there's so much of this now and a lot of young people are, are really into ritual um you know being aware of um, um astrology and you know moon phases etc cetera, etc cetera, and are interested do you think that there we might actually be returning or at least becoming more aware again I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'm not sure how widespread it is. I mean, you obviously think it is, but then you're very plugged into a, a community that, that understands that and believes in all that. And so, I, I, I wonder if that's, if that's true. You know, I wonder if it's true that it is as widespread as you say. I, I mean, I, th I think it's never gone away. There were always people who who, who believed in fairies. Um, the the trouble is, it was um, uh, you know, it got caught up in the in the division of culture in the seventeenth century. In in the sixteenth century, everybody be belonged to the same culture. That the same common people who looked at Midsummer Night's Dream 
in the Globe Theatre watching Shakespeare and the fairies on stage were didn't have a different mindset from the educated courtiers who sat in the gallery. You know, they they were a one culture. But in the 17th century, the educated culture split from the common culture. So it's difficult to know whether the the folklore of the common people has been continuous, you know, um, and that they've always just got, got, and because they tend to be, before the Industrial Revolution anyway, closer to the land than the yes. educated people, maybe they just went on believing in fairies while the educated people were banging their fists on the table and saying, these do not exist, you know. And maybe that is true today in the sense that we don't have the oral folklore in Western societies anymore, but we do have this vast underground literature, which nearly, every, for instance, UFO literature, huge, you know, yes. fairy literature is considerable, you know, yes. but it's almost unknown to the educated classes, you know. Um, you know, they're fringe subjects still, I think, aren't they? Are they mainstream in your experience? I, I mean, they are definitely fringe. Um, however, I think more and more people are interested, and um, and and it, it's definitely seems to be spreading. And and things, um, there are there's lots about fairy beings and encounters and offerings and fairy doors and things like that on TikTok. You go to parks and there's fairy doors everywhere. Um, you know, if you look at any pieces of local news, um, you, you tend to find people are putting fairy themed events on, you know, fairy, anything to do with fairies is pretty big. Um, it has mm. been that way for perhaps I'm going to say fairy doors, definitely maybe the last 20 years, I would say is when they sort of started. But but now they're they're very, very popular. So I feel like there's something happening and it, it just makes me wonder whether there's something about these times they feel do they do they feel demonic to you or is that not something that you really think about now um i don't know if you can talk about the times feeling demonic you know okay. I, I i'm not sure that, i'm not sure but maybe i'm maybe i'm out of touch maybe they are you know i mean i don't i don't know how to seriously to how seriously to take the um the fairy doors and and little girls wearing wings and well yeah like that um you know it might be at the sort of level of victorian whimsy about fairies oh absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. um i mean i i don't know it, it may be that that is sort of a symptom of, of a deeper groundswell as you're suggesting it may be i i have no idea <clears throat> i haven't seen any real people really grappling with the daimonic really you know right yeah <laughs> <laughs> apart from you apart from us but then you know yeah th there's us and, and there's and uh, you know people read my books not many though I have to say it's, it's you know I have a very very small readership so you know I myself am very very fringe you know so I'm very surprised to hear that and I'm not I mean you not know it's only... me yeah <laughs> <laughs> Every, everybody that I know absolutely raves about your books, and when you know, when I when I listen to well, other I rest podcasts... my case. You see, <laughs> that means that you know you're, you're, yeah, I mean, you you a... live in a particular media which is open. You know, well, we could we could look at it like this then: that um, people have, including myself, uh, and I'm not sure whether your your family felt the same, your your, your dad felt the same, were very reluctant to talk about their encounters I know that I was I eventually I did publicly and the reason I did was because I'd been speaking to people about their encounters and I felt that it was high time for me to talk about my own you know yeah, I was going yeah. to be asking other people um and it was a really really big big thing to do but there's been some kind of a sea change because I'm getting so many messages from people saying I've never been able to talk about this before but and telling me their encounter and they're actually willing to come on and 
you know, um, be a guest. And of course, usually my guests are anonymous because they're talking about something very, very personal. But occasionally, I mean, just the other week, I spoke to a guy and he was saying, no, let's let's do a video. Let's let's go for it. And, you know, people are willing not only to tell their stories, but kind of put their faces to it as well, which is I think that feels like a sea change. But um, but let's let's see. Let's watch this space yeah. and see how I, that that goes. I, 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 th I think it may be a phenomenon of the Internet. There's something very intimate about the internet and and people are emboldened when they see others on screen talking about their experiences mm -hmm. but they will come forward whereas before there was no outlet you know you you may tell your immediate family or friends who may or may not accept it yeah but um often people are are, are quite puzzled and gnawed at by by their experiences and it's with relief that they um that they find that there's now an outlet that there are podcasts like yours dedicated to these subjects and that in a sense makes it respectable you know others come forward and the more people come forward the more people come forward I, i'm thinking too of um of for instance the american bigfoot websites yeah you know thousands upon thousands yeah. of, of wonderful stories which you know when i was writing my book i had to plow through libraries of works to get encounters and sightings but there are millions told by the experiences themselves now on the internet it's, it's wonderful and um, it is. I, I even got onto a dogman website the other day that was a thing i'd never even heard of but bloody hell you know people are seeing these dog-headed creatures everywhere you know yeah. extraordinary yeah. stories you know the veracity of which I have no reason to doubt. You know, you can tell by their the tone of their voice that it was the most appalling encounter. Anyway, no, it's so true. So it may be that that, that these things actually will, people were always seeing stuff, and you know, and they're less marginalised now because we live in a more fluid culture where the internet is specially designed for people who are fringe. You know, mm, mm. and so maybe maybe the resurgence is just an um an artifact of, of of that of of this greater access or maybe people really are more often seeing funny things i don't know it's impossible to say really it is and i mean you know sort of talking about uh, touching on on dogman there and different sorts of beings i note that you uh, like myself um include you know creatures like werewolves um sasquatch and and all sorts of other sorts of beings and you know i i'm putting them all in a fairy bracket because i just I, i'd like to research them and so when people come to me I, um one one guy saw what seemed like a werewolf on a mountain this was in spain um but it was just defeating all the the natural laws by kind of going through walls and as you were mentioning before he was both that this this beast was both material and 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 not material because he was being able to go through walls but at the same time he was able to affect the foliage around him and make that shake you know right. and and there was there was yes. a sound sound coming from him as well right. um but he was definitely otherworldly and um so you know i find that that that's that's good good to know that you're the same and that you're kind of grouping them into these daemons these otherworldly beings what do you think how would you describe a daemon for people that aren't that familiar you know what what are the and it's difficult to to um be too specific about it but how would you describe them to people these daemons paradoxical marginal elusive shape-shifting uh, creatures uh, who also um i'm I mean, Socrates had a very interesting take on on diamonds, and he was an expert because he had a personal diamond, the most famous one in antiquity. And um, the reason that I wrote my book about the soul really was a lot of it recapped what I'd done before, but I'd, I'd left out the personal diamond in my other works, and I wanted to write more about that. That was one of the impetuses behind that book. But he said, that, you know, that the purpose of diamonds is to convey the will of the gods to men and the wishes of men to the gods so the gods they're, they're the way that the gods communicate to us their will and we in turn 
entreat the daemons to convey our wishes to the gods. Um, I think that's true of the personal daemon in a way that it's not probably true of a fairy you might run into on, on Exmoor. Mm. It doesn't seem to be conveying any message unless, except, you know, possibly the one that I've already said, his very appearance is a kind of message. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't see that he conveys our wishes to the gods necessarily so but they do have they do have a socrates was pointing to another characteristic of them which is as mediators yes but i think they do in some sense because of their very contradictory nature they they mediate between different states different states of nature different states of mind you know hence their their liking for borders literally they often mm. appear in 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 border-like places you know seashores or crossroads or or whatever um in the case of big black cats in britain uh, they like quarries and railway lines i don't know what that's about but my sister is the expert on that she's written a, the best single study of diamonds i think that there that there is probably <laughs> on mystery big cats so uh, yeah, sorry, I've got lost there. So th those are the main characteristics yeah. of, of the daimonic. But as I'm always saying, they're also the same characteristics that are displayed by the unconscious or the imagination. That that we can only catch the daimons by having by using a faculty, the imagination, which is as quick. And as marginal and as shape shifting as they are, as it were, and so their very appearance is is like an appearance out of the great collective imagination, in order to expand our own imaginations, and force us to embrace a much wider conception of what reality, which or what I might laughingly call reality, a much wider conception of reality um, than we had before. Yes. Does that make sense? Absolutely it, does. Something, something like that anyway. You know. it, it does It does seem to be like that for people, but there's this, you know, they have these experiences and then there's a shift in their perception of reality that is much needed. I mean, I think we all, we all need a different perspective sometimes. I think we can sort of go through life just um, sort of not really being present in any way um, and just going through the motions with things. And I think when you have an experience like that, it kind of wakes you up to maybe what your life path is and perhaps that for a lot of people is the message this is what you need to be doing and not in so many words but it just kind of wakes them up and they start to think about things and they start to you know realize some important aspects of, of their life that need to uh to be dealt with i mean i think one 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 um thing that i'm particularly interested in is the way that they appear to people as well i mean you have touched on this as well is that you know they're all awesome the, there's there's the, the response is one of awe and yet um sometimes these beings it, it's just a beautiful wonderful experience for that person and in other times it's absolutely terrifying um but it's not that they are well my understanding and, and i think you you've you know um mentioned this as well but they're they're not trying to be either uh, they just are, um, and and I guess you know our thoughts are that it's how we are perceiving them through a kind of human framework. Do you have anything else to to say there about the way that they appear and how we respond? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, uh, the trouble is that encounters with with diamonds aren't always i'm quickly scanning my mm. my list of fairy encounters you know yes but they're not always awesome i mean they may be awesome to us but they wouldn't be awesome to um an 18th century irish farm laborer right you know so it yeah, may yeah, be yeah, that yeah. as as you as you're suggesting really that it's it's difficult to know whether it's awe or just simple shock. I mean, a lot of people just just are shocked, so they just don't know what to make of this this thing. So, so awe and terror would be kind of intermingled. 
but that in it, but our response to, to the diamonds is is almost like an aspect of their own ambiguity that they can sometimes be benign mm. and sometimes be malevolent um and i don't know i think it was yates who said that you know if you see them first um, they're going to be malevolent, but if they see you first, they're going to be benign, something like that. You know, he had some quite sophisticated epistemology attached to seeing fairies. So I don't know what the what the answer is. Um, I I think that um, yes, I think what you bring to it, I think you're right that they are just themselves, but they are complicated and and amb ambiguous. And um, we can see them as benign or or malevolent. We can be frightened or awed in a delightful way by them, depending on what we bring to that encounter ourselves. An open-minded person, you know, who who's always sort of thought at the back of their mind that fairies might exist, would be delighted to see one, you know. But but a, a hard-boiled rationalist would be appalled, you know. <laughs> so I think maybe that's the answer yes <laughs> I think yeah it is it is uh interesting speaking to people and um you know they, they never sort of react in the way that they think they would react either way whether they are a rationalist or you know a fan of, of fairies how did your father um t talk to you about his own experience and and what was that like for him um, he was fairly neutral about it. I think he was very surprised. He was sitting under a tree in a place called Muckross Abbey, which is quite a famous abbey. He was waiting for his sister. Uh, it's near Kalani. Um, and uh, he just looked up. And in the ruins of the abbey, he could see three small figures quite near him, but, you know, 60 feet away, 20 meters, something like that. <laughs> and two of them were, were fighting or tussling. Uh, they had a bag. And they were tussling over this bag, pulling it to and fro. And there was a third fairy, a much older, a very wizened little man, um, dressed in sort of, you know, quite 18th century frock coaty type of garment, you know. And um, he was looking on them toler tolerantly as if they were children squabbling. And he suddenly looked up and looked at my father and their eyes met and poof, they all went, they disappeared like that, you know, like that. classic. My, his sister's experience was, what. Well, uh, I remember actually, uh, I remember go, we, we used to go every year on holiday to Ireland uh, to visit relatives and so on. And I remember we'd we'd park the car to have a picnic and um, we'd unloaded all the stuff and laid out the picnic. And suddenly my father said, right, we're going. We said, what are you talking about? You know, he said, pack up now. And he was pre present with us was his was his sister who'd also seen the fairies. Uh, she she was his elder sister, uh, the aunt who lived in Ireland, who he stayed with, and she and she backed him up and said, "Don't argue, just get you know, pack up and get in the car." And of course, we we picnic at a at a suitable spot, which happened to be a fairy fort, and my father had just known that that we were not welcome there, you know. Yes. And uh, he didn't say much about it. He just said, you know. They don't want us there. We're moving on, you know. No, and, uh, this is it. And we, we were all a bit sort of subdued by this. We could see that we could see he was deadly serious, you know, which he wasn't often, but when he was, it was frightening, you know. So we all knuckled under. But his sister, um uh I don't know if I should be telling you this. Yeah, you I don't think need I would. to. Yeah, I know I don't need to, but um his sister was was had a very unnerving experience. She was very um, friendly with the local Church of Ireland vicar where she lived in County Leash, and he died suddenly. And she was very upset by this because you know he was a great pal chum of hers and so on. And she was sitting in her orchard, 
she had quite a nice farmhouse they had land <clears throat> and she suddenly heard voices and she thought funny i don't remember leaving the radio on or anything like that you know she, she sounded like sort of distant playing of the radios just you know little voices talking to and fro and so on and she looked around and, and suddenly she saw that this dead vicar standing uh, in the orchard um, with about four or five little people little fairies Goodness. standing around him two of them had hold of his cassock and he was looking rather pale and shaken to be honest things like that and i thought it was so interesting because you know part of fairy lore is, is you're particularly vulnerable to abduction when you're in an in-between state you know before you've been baptized or before a mother who's had a child is churched after giving birth and before the um this was you know after he died but before the funeral you know so he was in an in-between state as it were yeah. it's almost as if you know the fairies had got his soul you know it reminded me of the classic story of the reverend kirk you know yeah. in scotland who was who died standing on his fairy fort as it were he had a heart attack or or did he you know that we say he died of a heart attack on the fairy fort others say no he was touched by the fairies had a stroke died and was taken, was taken. by the fairies you know yeah. and it's still rumored that there's no body in his coffin just stones you know because he's in in the other world but the other world fairy not the other world of the christian heaven so on. so my aunt's story was you know had a lot of had a lot of resonance for me and and was quite it's quite disconcerting you know yeah it makes me wonder whether he was even i mean on from another perspective whether he was aware of those beings in his lifetime Yes, I don't know. I don't okay. know anything about that. Yeah. And he could have been. He could easily. Yeah. Easily. Yes. It's very interesting. I don't know. But but he's not the first and he won't be the last dead person to be seen amongst the, the fairies, you know. Absolutely. The, the yeah. dead and the fairies are are interchangeable. Yeah. So. Quite so, absolutely. I think in terms of the the other world as well, um, one of the things that you mention is that you know to every person uh, the another person is is an other world, as in there are you know a, a mystery. And I like that idea too, is that you know within us we contain all of these mysteries. Like for instance, you know we have no idea whether that priest um, had had. Uh, an awareness of of the fairies and what his what his own private approach to these worlds are and you know we don't know from one to the other um and that we do with, with our, within our own consciousness have these endless possibilities um can you say any more about that at all uh no, no except that um except that if you subscribe to a, a completely different worldview from the modern one as i do I, I more or less I mean there are going to be overlaps obviously between worldviews but uh, in, deep down I believe in the pre-scientific revolution worldview um, in which everything is connected by analogy in the great chain of being and so mm. on uh, and if you believe in that world if you believe in the world as, as above so below you know that everything is analogous to everything else um you believe um, that, for instance, we are all microcosms of the greater macrocosm. In other words, that we are the great world in miniature. And as such, there is no um, boundary between us, or there isn't a boundary in the same way as we now think, between us and the outside world. Um, in other words, we all exist in the same we're all images in the same psychic space or as I, I would call it the imagination or po possibly the soul of the world you know these are the various models I run through and they're all e equally well they're all analogous to each other and, and so it wouldn't be surprising uh, if 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 we're all sort of individual souls within a greater 
field of soul, as it were, it wouldn't be at all surprising if we were all equally mysterious to each other, but equally porous to each other. Mm. And that amongst the images that exist in the soul of the world, there aren't just human images, there are also images of all sorts of other creatures and entities who exist on an equal footing with us. That's an absolute standard belief in the most, the earliest and most widespread worldview, animism, as it's rather bestially called, you know. But for animists, people in the Amazon, people in Siberia, um, large parts of the Americas, they just think that everything is soul and, and every image in the world, every natural object, including ourselves, is an image in, in the soul. Yes. And which is has a, a more or less fluid relationship with the material. But, you know, we are pretty much material, but other creatures can sort of move in and out of materiality and so on. Because, you know, soul, imagination is a fluid field which which is entirely composed of images. But, but yeah. also with, within that, there's this sense of, um, from speaking to people, there's this sense of recognition. And I think what you were just describing there is in some ways kind of related to that and that there's this knowingness. So sometimes... Um, even between two people, not just even with a, a being, uh, sorry, a person and another worldly being, you'll get this sense of recognition. Yes, yes. And it's yes. it's it's um, it's unmistakable. And and sometimes people t talk to me about this when they're describing their encounter, that there's this oh I I kind of felt like I knew knew it from somewhere or they felt familiar to me there's a familiarity and we do get that between people as well so it it really I do find that very interesting that we're you know sometimes um I could describe it like this that we're in the supermarket and we're doing our shopping and if somebody's standing behind us or somebody walks past we almost get a sense of who that person is there's a there's a it's a sense not that we knew them from another time but almost that we can kind of sense from them something about their lives and what you were describing about this kind of this porousness between us I feel like that definitely I've def feel that I've definitely felt that uh with with other people but yeah this sense of fam familiarity and recognition um that could potentially be just our recognition of um the soul world and knowing it for that moment yes. just enough for us what, yes yeah. yes i think that's what it is i i think since we're all primarily souls as the neoplatonists would say um you know that if we we can brush past another soul and if, whenever you make contact with another person's soul which is um you know concealed beneath their bodies um we have that little frisson you know that moment of recognition and indeed, since we all participate in the great world soul, you know, it may be that that we are attracted by similarity of of um, experience or similarity of temperament. or uh, And people often put that down to, for instance, saying, oh, well, we must have known each other in another life or something like that, which which is a sort of quite a nice metaphor for, for I, I mean, I don't think it's literally true, probably, but it's a nice metaphor for the idea that that you know that in our innermost being in our in our souls um we have an affinity with certain other souls which would normally just be concealed by, by our appearance you know by our by our material bodies and so on you know it's very but true i think that may well be true and uh, and and that's that i think is what things like synchronicity are about you know but you know synchronicities are, are aren't useful in any way but they have a sort of meaning you know but they're not mysterious if you think that we're all you know if the if you think of the outer world as not being outer as it were as us containing it and also being contained by it but the, the world you know um it it shouldn't be surprising that our inner life should have correspondences with the outer world at certain moments whether it's meeting a kindred spirit, as we say, or whether it's um, some event or something happening, which seems to us 
so amazing uh, that it can't possibly be coincidence. You know, it's more like mm. providence than coincidence, something like that. But True. from my, you know, archaic worldview, that wouldn't be surprising at all. Mm. It almost sounds as if perhaps the veil drops for that moment, whether it be, uh, you know, seeing the other worldly being or something about that contact with a person or a place or a situation triggers um, the the outer world to suddenly um, shift for a moment or, or drop in some way where we kind of see the truth beneath it and the soul beneath it and recognize that, you know, people talk about being seen you know maybe it's just yes. one of those types of moments um, yes yes I, I think that's right yeah 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 um i think it's interesting that uh, as a child then you experienced healing as well i mean that's something that i personally find very interesting was that your sort of one of your first um sort of sense of of awareness of of the possibilities of healing what was that like Oh, well, it was just, you know, my mum's eccentricity, you know, she'd really, I mean, I remember having a healer come to see, come and did, lay hands on me when I was really quite young, about five or something like that. <clears throat> I thought it was a bit odd, but I put up with it. My mother thought it was a good idea, you know, but she did, wasn't great pains to experience it to me. But later in life, um, uh, I... I did actually need a healer, and uh, I went. I found a good one, uh, or rather, my mother went to one and urged me to go. <laughs> and she thought that I I had healing powers myself, and offered to train me up. And and I did go along a bit, and um, and and sort of have a go. And she assured me that I was doing okay, but it, it didn't really stick with me. Um, and I don't know how true it was. You know, I have no idea. But she did. She did sort me out from quite a dark place, and she did it instantaneously. So I was very, very impressed by her. You know, I was a bit sort of psychologically messed up, and she just did one session, and it was like um, I could see colours again. You know, she just cleared me up in one go. So, so I, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a strong believer in 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 healers, but uh, they vary a lot in quality. You know, I've, I've seen enough to know that. I don't think I've ever, I've never not met a charlatan. I, they're all sincere, but some of them fancy themselves as healers, I think, which yeah. is quite different from being good at it. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. And it's the same with any kind of uh, any, yeah. any kind of profession, I guess, as well, isn't it? But yeah, you're right there. But I, I think your mum was right in that, you know, faith is really important. Um, I think it helps people, you know, particularly in difficult times to have some kind of faith, I think, and any faith, to be honest, I think is helpful, whatever whatever it is, because it's something that you can, you know, turn to. Um, it, it seems that way to me. But um, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Not that she, not that she went to faith healers, no, I mean, she believed that they were technicians, you know, that they yeah. knew how to, that like my, as just as my grandmother could channel people, she thought people, could, others could channel healing powers, you know, and she just regarded that as a, uh, as a normal thing for some people to be able to do. Uh, and I think she's right. Yeah. yeah. But yes, but she also had faith. I mean, she believed in God, you know, so. That was all good. Yeah, well, I guess we'll we'll you know see how um, this all pans out with with this uh, latest interest in in fairies and the research around fairies and encounters. And I think you know more and more people will be finding your work because they're interested in these subjects. Um, so thank you very much for speaking to me and for for sharing your experiences as well and your your family experiences. Do you think that I mean I I could see demonic reality as some kind of documentary series where you might be able to sort of you know look into things. I'd love to see something like that. Do you think that would ever be on the cards? <laughs> well, no one's ever asked me. Oh, they should. <laughs> well, I, I've. <laughs> I have been asked to sort of feature in in the odd documentary. It, it's true to say, stick in my two cents worth. But but um, yeah. Well, no, I haven't been asked. And, and to be honest, I don't think I'd do it. I think you need the long. Well, I don't know. I might do it. 
uh, it, it's moot anyway, but uh, you do need a long sort of run up, you know, to talk about the full sort of context of of fairy law, which is only really available in, in a book where you can digress and speculate and philosophize, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I, I'm not sure it, it lends itself to the soundbite. Um, no, but of it course, it's, but it's always interesting to hear of people's experiences. I mean, I do it for that alone, actually, you know, just to meet meet people with wonderful tales to tell, you know. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, but to expand the whole worldview which makes fairy experiences intelligible takes a book, really. It takes more than one book, to be honest. But you know. Well, they're both, I mean, the, the two that I have, um, I haven't got Mercurius, I must get that one. And I want to get stuck into your novels as well, because they look fantastic, especially The Good People. I really should have that, so I'm going to get that. Oh, oh well, that's, that's a sort of companion volume to Diamonic Reality. Yeah. Because it's one thing reporting experiences, but if you have a, a novelistic instinct, you want to get inside it all. Mm. You know, you want to do people who have, you know, you want to do people who have those experiences. You don't want to expound it about it objectively. So there was always a bit of me regretting Daimonic Reality was a non-fiction book. You know, so I wrote, I wrote a fiction book to as a companion to it. Really, yeah. So. That's amazing. Well, I think it would really work well as documentaries. One of my uh, actually, um, yeah, you see, you you mentioned Mercurius, you see, but I mean, yeah. that's the whole the, the realm of alchemy. I mean, that was my initiation into the other world. You know, I, I did stick a UFO in the in the in Mercurius, but I wasn't very interested in that sort of thing. But as a result of studying alchemy, all sorts of things began to become clear to me. You know, it's a very profound discipline. And it combines so many, oh, it combines all your faculties, you know, it, it's chemistry and metallurgy and at the same time, philosophy, art, you know, imagination. It's, uh, it's fantastic. That's, that's why my Mercurius is so long. It's the longest book I wrote because really it's two books, you know, it's a non-fiction and fiction book combined, you know. Yeah, I mean, I I have never it's really. A tiny book, yeah. you know, sorry, yes. No, I was just going to say I have never got into alchemy properly, and so you know, perhaps that's my next, uh, perhaps that's my next rabbit hole that I'll go down. I probably sort of won't uh, rise to the surface for another five years if I go down that avenue. I think I'll probably. <laughs> my advice is, Joe, don't. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that way madness lies. Yeah, it, it's for yeah. I think you I'll know, read the to... book. <laughs> yeah. Yes, read the book and see if you see if you fancy it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it does look excellent. And and this um the Philosopher's Secret Fire as well is just a fantastic book. Thank Absolutely you so much. Absolutely brilliant. And and so much for people that are interested in understanding the other worlds, the encounters with, with fairies. I mean, you know, two really useful books. Um and I, for one, would very much like to see that as a documentary series. So <laughs> please do that. Well, sometime. the trouble is, people want explanations, don't they? You know. Yeah. And I don't give explanations. I, well, I think I, I think they're so. I think you do in these in your writing. It's very. Clear. I think I make them intelligible. Yes, I think you know. I think it gives people a handle on them. But nothing can explain that. They're not problems to be solved. No. Fairies, you know, they're mysteries you enter into. As I always say, so an encounter is an initiation. It's not a, it's not an observation. You know. It, well, this is it. I mean, people, you know, you can't. I think in in my um, in my research, I'm definitely not trying to convince people of the existence of fairies. That's not what I'm interested in. I think, and a lot of other people feel the same. It's more about just you know talking about them and 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 finding finding out how it was for different people who want to kind of talk about it so one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is what you thought you know what myth are we going through at this time and and if we're seeing kind of you know the peak of enlightenment or the peak of scientism that we're in now I would argue that perhaps you know uh, what we saw with you know through the sort of covid times that's sort of peak scientism that we're in at the moment then if we're moving away from scientism, which we might equate with the way that 
and, and through the enlightenment we might equate that with ego if we're perhaps moving away from ego and towards a heart centered uh, culture instead in a modern western society then being able to be seen for who we are um whatever form that takes is it's got to be central to, to you know to feel accepted so that's another way to look at it but either way i do wonder if we are all living our myths and if the world is its own consciousness then what myth is the pervading myth at the moment that we're stepping through do you want yes to or, or asking which which of the um, you know the thing about imagination is it it is self-limiting it's not it's not infinite and we know that because all mythologies have a set number of gods in the pantheon you know that there are only certain perspectives through which you can view the world and all, but yeah, and yet all the gods interact with each other. They fight and intermarry and so on. So it's very hard to single them out. But so you could be asking what god is behind, you know, modern society. You, what you do can you think? See, <laughs> you, well, you could see how the goddesses arose. You know that Hera mm -hmm. was in charge of the housewife of the fifties. You know, and then up rose Athena, who is unmarried, warrior-like, wise. You can see she's the goddess behind feminism, for, for example. You know, um, and then there's a, and then there's Artemis, also unmarried, and so on. Yes. She's the, she's the god of of the hunt, of nature, of of and also of childbirth, which is bizarre, strange. But I think that indicates she might be um, an agent who who brings creativity out of other people and you can see she's one of the goddesses behind ecology i mean gaia's yes. obviously a strong one but there's an artemisian side to the to the to the eco warriors you know absolutely with their insistence on absolute purity you know that the thing is that artemis must never be violated actian who peaked on her bathing that was illegitimate you don't look at artemis you know naked otherwise you get torn to death by your own hounds you know um by yourself in other words you know so you can see you know that that's a very simplistic way of putting it but you can see how movements in society could be you know underpinned by psychological perspectives and forces which used to be called gods and which Jung called archetypes and i'm not sure i'm not sure i'm i know that hermes is in charge of the internet for instance being god of communication but also you know the arch trickster um so we'll see yes and i i haven't decided which which god is now in charge of our modern madness yes yeah yeah although I, I, mars I... has really his or the aries the war god has raised his ugly head you know and so forth that came out of the blue that's the thing about the gods they burst in on us you know mm. Oh. Mm. Very true. Very, Very true. You know, we, you know, we think we we know what's going to happen. You know, the end of history, as it as it was announced in nineteen ninety. Well, how did that work out? <laughs> 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 so I'm not sure if we're going to break through into a higher level of of consciousness and re participation in nature. As you, I'm. I think it's more it's more cyclical. You know that. That, that we go back to older things, you know, rather than, you know, I'm I'm not entranced by the model of history as a linear progression, which is a very enlightenment notion, that we're that we're moving inexorably through science and knowledge towards the omega point of, of, you know, quite the opposite seems to be true. You know, we seem to be more and more plunged into darkness and superstition. You know, uh, and that. In, includes a lot of science which is riddled with all sorts of problems yeah it is it is anyway. but I, I i do feel that people are looking back to these other ways of seeing the world that you presented and as you've mentioned you know it's right through from kind of uh, greeks and romans even through up to the medieval period um you know until we sort of happened upon um 
the later developments in the uh, enlightenment and and of course many of us really connect in with the romantics view because at a time of great change as we are in now with digitalization and of course they were in um you know going into the we had the enlightenment industrial period later um you know we we are like the romantics kind of tapping back into nature and in that way i think a lot of people really do resonate with with the way that the romantics saw the world and yeah um i i'm hopeful and um uh, as you say we'll we'll see we'll see what happens okay. because uh, yeah. We're always surprised by what happens next, aren't we, really? It's never a dull moment. <laughs> but I, I certainly join you in a wish that the sacred will be, you know, we live in such a profane world that, you know, any anything that tends towards, you know, the resacralization, what a horrible word, of, of, of nature and the things that really matter, and indeed of, you know, things like soul and imagination, uh, would be w welcome as far as I'm concerned. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And that's what I, well, my books are a, a long peon of hope that that might happen, I think. Yeah. I do. I do hope so too. Thank you. And do you right. have any, uh, do you have any plans for uh, writing? Sort of yeah, I'm writing something at, at the moment, but it's oh, fantastic. Um, well, it's, it's not a book. It's too short to be a book. It's too long to be an essay. And it's, it, it, I've returned to uh, anthropology again okay. because, um, because um, yes, I've been looking at sort of mo modern advance in, in, in anthropology and I'm finding it absolutely fascinating and it's almost unknown outside its own discipline because it's couched in such appalling esoteric intellectual French language, you know, that it's, it's, it's nearly impenetrable to the layman. But if I can just do a, a modest job in translating some of some of the bits of it that I really like, um, I'll be I'll have done enough, I think. Yeah. Oh, that's marvelous. Um, yeah, I really look forward to that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, uh, that, yeah. that's on going. Whether whether I'll, it always t opens out. That's the trouble. In, you know that that's I've got the sort of mind that you, I do one thing and then I have to do it. You know, and then it reminds me of another thing, and the next thing I've written another bloody great book. You know. Exactly. Well, please, please do keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck with your book, Joe. Thank I you. Hope, I, I, wh wh how near are you to finishing? Um, it's been a very interesting year. Let's let's say. Uh, so I am slightly behind. So I think it will. It was going to be towards the end of this year, but I think it will be kind of, um, you know, to, towards the sort of the first third of next year. Let's say. Right. Uh, got a bit more time. So, um, to reading it, yeah, thank you, thank Good, you, yeah. and uh, mm. thanks very much for taking your time to speak to thank me. Thank you as for well. having me, Joe. Thank you, thanks. And the best place to get you is www.harper.org slash Patrick. Lovely, mm. thanks a lot, okay. and all right, uh, bye. See you soon. Bye, yeah, bye. bye.